Welcome to Exploring Computing. Today's topic is artificial intelligence. As you may have noticed already, my voice sounds a little bit different, and that's because I'm not Dr. Young, I'm Ivy, I'm a TA for this course, and I'll be giving the next few video lectures. I first want to give a brief overview of what we'll be doing for the next few videos. So this first video lecture, we're going to talk about what is AI. I'm going to go over the definition and the history of AI to give a little bit of background to why AI is the field it is today. The second video will be on the different subfields of AI. We often hear about terms like artificial intelligence, machine learning, supervised learning, deep neural networks, so on and so forth. And there, we all have a general idea that they're related to artificial intelligence, but we don't really know how. And so I'll be going over what these terms mean and how they're actually related to each other. And finally, for the last set of lectures, I'll be going over a concrete example of how a simple machine learning system is actually implemented. In addition to that, I'll also go over how more complex systems are built. So with that said, let's get on with our first lecture. So let's begin by going over some examples of AI. Typically, when I go do this lecture, I'll ask the students, what are some examples of AI that you see in your daily life? I strongly implore you to actually answer, try to answer this question. Take out a piece of paper, pause the video, and write down some examples of AI that you can think of. I hope you had a chance to do that, and now let's compare your answers to mine. So some answers that I've gotten in the past are things like autonomous vehicles, so think self-driving cars like Tesla's, game players, so these are AIs that were trained to play games. So for example, you may have heard of Deep Blue, which is the first computer chess playing system to win a chess match against a reigning world champion, or things like AlphaGo, which is the first program to defeat a Go world champion. It can also be, you know, the computer in the video game that you play against. Another example is speech recognition systems. So things where you talk at it and it understands what you're talking about. Image recognition systems, which are systems where you feed it a picture and it's able to tell you what it is, who it is, so on and so forth. And also digital personal assistants. So Siri, Google Assistant, Alexa are all examples of those. And these are all great answers. They're all perfectly valid examples of AI. But there's also a set of answers that people don't typically give, and they're worth talking about because it kind of demonstrates that AI is actually everywhere. One example is automatic trading systems, which is a tool that stockbrokers use to automatically purchase and sell stocks at the right time. One very famous example is the Black-Scholes model, which actually caused a stock market crash in 1987. So what happened was it was so popular and worked so well that a bunch of stockbrokers started using it. And once it decided that the stock market was not going to do so well, it started selling stocks, which then triggered the model to even further suggest that there is going to be a stock market crash, which then caused it to sell more stocks. And it kind of created this self-fulfilling prophecy of having a stock market crash. Another example would be recommender systems. So when you go on Amazon or eBay and you purchase a bunch of things and it tells you, hey, do you want to also buy this other thing? And it's often creepily a good idea. That is also thanks to the power of AI. It observes the data of other people's past purchase histories and your past his purchase histories, and it bases its suggestions off of those. Another example would be Fitbit, classifying your physical activity, and it does it just based off of your heart rate and the number of steps that you take. It can figure out whether you're swimming or running, also determining medical dosages. And so when you take a certain medication that has a very specific dose requirement, it often is a little bit of a trial and error to figure out how much of this medication you actually need. And so computer scientists and medical doctors have paired up together to figure out an AI that will help determine what the good, what the best starting dosage should be um, based off of people uh, based off of the data of people with similar statistics as you do. Machine translation, which translates words, sentences, paragraphs from one language to another. So think Google Translate. Spam filters, which can be found in your 
email systems, which automatically classifies a text as whether or not it's spam. And things like sound filtering, which is when you have a recording with a bunch of different voices, how do you identify the different sources of noises and isolate that specific source? And this one's an interesting one because if you're a Stanford student who has had courses that were recorded in NVIDIA Auditorium, you'll actually see that in action. So you'll notice that, you know, when the professor's lecturing, you can hear the professor very clearly, but then when a student speaks up, it's almost like the, you know, a different microphone was activated and you can only hear the students and not the surrounding sounds of all the other people. And so the way that this was done is they actually put a bunch of different mics throughout the room. And so if you look at the ceiling, you'll actually notice that there's a bunch of mics and they'll use those mics as the different uh, as the different recordings, and they'll use AI to combine all of those recordings to isolate the different sources of noises. And finally, we have things like Facebook friend group suggestions, which is when Facebook suggests, "Hey, do you know this person?" and they turn out to be creepily correct. So as you can see from the examples that we previously listed, AI is very broad and very fluid, and it seems like it encompasses a bunch of different things. So what exactly is AI? What's the definition? Well, it turns out there is no standard definition, which is partly why it's so broad and fluid. But that's a little bit of a non-answer. So let's go through some potential good definitions of what is AI. The first potential definition that we'll examine is it's the ability of a computer system to do tasks that generally require human intelligence. Let's talk about the strengths and weaknesses of this definition. So it's good because it kind of captures the essence of artificial and intelligence. It's artificial because it's a computer system and it's intelligent because it does tasks that require human intelligence. This definition is very intuitive and it seems to encompass all of the things that we had previously listed as examples of AI. But the problem with de this definition is it's a little bit too general and too broad. Almost anything that a computer does would fall into this definition. So for example, the calculator app that you have on your computer, it can calculate what's one plus one. That requires human intelligence too, and it's also part of your computer system. But we wouldn't typically call that AI. So let's look at a different definition. Let's consider the definition that it's a computer system that is capable of doing something that it was not explicitly programmed to do. Now, this is a decent definition of AI as well, and it also addresses the problem with the first definition being a little bit too broad. However, the problem with this definition is it's now a little bit too specific, but also vague at the same time. It's a little bit too specific because it eliminates more structured AI subfields, such as expert systems, which are used to make logical deductions. So it better fits the definition of machine learning rather than AI in general. It's also a little bit vague because there isn't a distinct boundary for whether or not something is explicitly programmed into a system or not. At the end of the day, all artificial intelligence systems have been programmed by computer scientists, and they were explicitly programmed to learn. Perhaps what this definition is talking about is that programmers didn't go line by line saying, if this happens, then do that but it's a little bit unclear exactly where that boundary should be drawn. So while these two definitions are not perfect, hopefully our discussion of them has given you a better idea of what people mean when they talk about artificial intelligence. So now the question that you might be asking yourself is why isn't there a definition of AI? And I think the honest answer is that just no one has come up with a good one yet. It turns out the field is actually very young and it's been rapidly evolving. So let's talk a little bit about the history of AI and how it's changed a lot since its conception. When people first started talking about the idea of artificial intelligence, they were mostly talking about what we would now refer to as a general artificial intelligence, which is making a computer as human-like as possible. So think the hosts in Westworld if you watch that TV show. So one gold standard that was used was the Turing test. This was proposed by Alan Turing in 1936, which can be basically summarized as, can a computer system fool a human into thinking that the computer is a human? 
One implementation of this test would be a human tester interacts with an entity via a text conversation. And so they will go back and forth having a conversation, and by the end of the conversation, the tester will have to determine whether the entity they were interacting with was an AI or a person. And if they're unable to tell, then the entity that they were testing passes the Turing test. And while we sometimes refer to the Turing test as a gold standard, it's no way a perfect definition. So for example, in 2014, a computer program called Eugene Gustman simulated a 13-year-old Ukrainian boy and did pass the Turing test. However, his age and the fact that he wasn't a native English speaker greatly limited the scope of conversations that could be had. So even though we have already created systems that can pass the Turing test, that doesn't mean that we're anywhere near being finished with achieving artificial intelligence and that we're anywhere close to having the kind of technology that we see that hosts have in Westworld, for example. Now, the term artificial intelligence wasn't even coined until 1955 by a computer scientist named John McCarthy, and he was actually a professor at Stanford. He described the field of artificial intelligence as the science and engineering of making intelligent machines. And this is in no way a definition either. We can apply the same critiques that we had earlier to this de definition. But he was the first person to even use the word artificial intelligence. From the late 50s to the early 70s, people were really excited about the field of AI, and a lot of effort was put into research in AI. However, people didn't really get super far. So for example, in 1966, we came up with the Eliza chatbot. The photo on the right shows an interaction with Eliza, and feel free to take a second and pause the video and read the interaction. But in case it's a little bit too small or too blurry, it's basically a conversation, and it seems like she's able to speak in grammatically correct sentences. So she will say things like, how are you today? What would you like to discuss? And she's also able to respond to the things that are being written to her. However, there's kind of a human element that's missing. For example, in case you can't see the text because it's too small, she ends up asking the user, do you enjoy being depressed? And why do you want to be happy? And at the end of the day, she's like, oh, that's pretty interesting that you want to be happy. And so she's clearly not human. Unfortunately, the advancements in AI plateaued around the early 70s and researchers and the government who funded them became rather discouraged. And this was known as the AI winter. From 1974 to 1980, not a lot of research was funded or done at all. The Japanese government did fund a major AI project in 1980, which was based off of the idea of creating an expert system that was able to make logical deductions, but it was a total failure and the AI field fell quiet again in 1993. But luckily for the field, and potentially for us, if you've kept up with tech news, then you'll have seen that AI has made a big comeback in the last few years. And a big part of that can be attributed to the switch from generalized AI to narrow AI. Narrow artificial intelligence can be understood as achieving human performance on specific tasks instead of the entire task of trying to emulate being a human. This fits in with the overall theme of modularity and abstraction in computer science. Just as a reminder, we have heard the term modularity in the software engineering lectures. And it basically means that we break things into discrete manageable chunks, which are sometimes called modules. And in this case, we've broken the complex task of trying to emulate human behavior into specific tasks. So instead of trying to build an entity that can fool a person into thinking that the entity is also human, We've broken down this entire task into much smaller tasks, and this turns out to be much more useful to us. And so these smaller tasks would be things like, can we make a machine drive as well as a human? Or can we make a machine do translation as well as a human? And we're not trying to all squish this into one giant robot that can do everything, but rather we just want the specific tasks that are useful to us. But there have also been other technological improvements that have really spearheaded this AI renaissance. These improvements include faster processors, larger memory, GPU optimizations, better algorithms, and more data. So basically what often happens when we train an AI is we take a large amount of data and use that to improve or reinforce the models that we have that will help determine the behavior of the AI. 
This is typically done by applying various operations from linear algebra, which I'll go into more detail in future lectures. But we want to apply these operations repeatedly on the scale of millions of times. And so the faster processors, larger memory, and GPU optimizations allow us to more effectively apply these operations, which will increase the iteration speed of training our AI, and it also allows us to handle the larger amount of data that we have. Similarly, the better algorithms also allow us to use less iterations, and so that also increases the speed of training the AI. But most importantly, none of these would be helpful without the larger amount of data that we have. So just to bring home the point, of the importance of having a large amount of data, let's look at the graph which compares the amount of labeled data we have with respect to the performance of the model that we're training. So if we were to look at a traditional learning model, its performance with respect to the amount of data we have to train it on would look something like this. So you can see that it first improves rapidly at first, and then it eventually tapers off with more and more data. But even here, it's still increasing just slowly. And for a slightly more complicated learning model, such as a small neural network, its performance with respect to how much data it has to be trained on might look something like this. And if we had an even more complex learning model, such as a large neural or a deep neural network, it might have a learning curve that looks something like that. Now, I know we haven't really talked about the differences between a neural network and a traditional learning algorithm, but for now, just think of this uh, learn traditional learning algorithm as a model that is very simple, whereas a small neural network is slightly more complicated, and a large neural, ne neural network is a model that is more complicated than all of the above. And so the more complicated it gets, the better its performance with the same amount of data. And all of these differences between the different models that we have fall into the category of having better algorithms. But the important thing to note is that if we only had a small amount of data, so let's say we only had this amount of data, then the difference between the performance of the traditional learning algorithm would be somewhere around there, whereas the performance of a more complicated learning, uh, learning algorithm would be over here, and the difference between the two wouldn't be that large. But if we had a really large amount of data, then, then the performance of the more simple learning algorithm would be down there, whereas the more complicated learning algorithm would have a performance up there, and that difference is much larger. So we can see that even though we might have better algorithms, these better algorithms don't truly shine until we have a larger amount of data to train them with. And this fact has really shaped the technological world today. You might have heard that Google makes a huge amount of money by selling ads, and that is completely true. And the reason why they are able to sell ads so well is because they have been able to gather a huge amount of data from all the people that use its services. So with data such as your search history or the contents of your email, it's able to figure out general consumer trends and it's able to figure out what people who have similar search histories or email contents like you would be more susceptible towards buying when it comes to showing you an ad. And so by combining this huge amount of data that it's collected from everyone, it's able to extremely efficiently target the ads towards you. You also see the same trend in Facebook with their knowledge of all of the Facebook friends that you have and how it was used by Cambridge Analytica to target political ads as well. And finally, we have an example like Tesla, which seems to be one of the leading companies in making self-driving cars. So a large reason why they've been able to improve their algorithm so quickly is because they have a huge amount of data that has been collected from people who drive their cars. So they have a large competitive edge compared to other companies like Waymo because they're able to obtain a large amount of driving data. You may have seen some Waymo vehicles driving around Palo Alto that have a bunch of sensors on them, and every single one is collecting data to train these models better. However, you'll notice that every single Waymo car needs to be driven by an operator, whereas Tesla is able to obtain all of its data just from the users that have purchased a Tesla. And so for every single Waymo car, you see a lot more Teslas on the road. And as a result, Tesla is able to obtain that valuable training data much more effectively.
So in conclusion, I hope that you have a better understanding of what we mean when we talk about AI, as well as have a better understanding of the history of AI and why AI is the way it is today.